Okay, three, two, one. From our beautiful studios in Chicago on a warm climate to the warm climate of San Francisco. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's show. You're listening to Baseball Outside the Box, the show that interviews baseball's best coaching minds who love to challenge the status quo. And yes, we are ready to go. And in case you missed today's show, don't forget to be up on YouTube at Peter Caliendo. Also, the audio at Baseball outsidethebox.com and don't forget check us out on twitter our guest today gonna be a great one yes he is italian american and i know we've had a few 800 wins in collegiate baseball from the university of san francisco and also a usa national team coach let's welcome a great person he's got he was also in the hall of fame for the colorado high school baseball coach association i got a chance to be there let's welcome nino gerentano how you doing nino i'm good pete thanks for having me i'm excited to be here yeah, th- sorry for the delay there, guys. And also, Nino, um, you know, I've been doing this quite a bit, but I still, still learning. And, you know, I'm my own director, producer, light man, you do it all. I write the scripts, try to, I'm getting better and better, little by little, but we're excited to have you. So let's get started. I think the right thing, and everybody, you know, ask any questions anytime you want. I'll be glad to unmute the mic. You can do it if you just want to ask directly or go right to the chat and type it in. Um, I think the appropriate thing, Nino, is the best thing is, uh, let's just start with college baseball, where it's at, and also, um, you know, what you're, you know, like recruiting, what the, what's, that, what's it going to look like, um, you know, from your standpoint, and also from the player standpoint, and coaches out there, high school coaches. Yeah, I think, you know, right now, college baseball, we're, we're in a tough spot, you know, we're, we're, we're not out there recruiting right now, we're in a dead period, we've been in a dead period since March, so that dead period is going to last until June 31st right now and could be extended all the way through July. So, you know, right now we'd be uh, in a conference tournament and, and trying to get into the NCAA regional and then uh, out there recruiting at uh, camps and uh, showcases and uh, seeing kids play in tournaments and uh, none of that is happening right now. So uh, we're basically recruiting virtually, you know, seeing videos of kids and, and getting uh, letters from kids. We can't have any in person. Uh, I got him. I got you. All right, keep going. I got you. My fault. Okay. Can't have any in person conversations, uh, you know, with the kids. Um, so that, that makes it kind of tough. Um, and, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, some of the college programs are uh, two years in advance in recruiting, uh, where at the University of San Francisco, we go a little bit slower. So, our 2021 class is, is small. Uh, we're, you know, we're used to seeing all these kids play over the summer, trying to swoop up all the late bloomers and, and all the kids that are coming on a little bit later than everybody else. So that's going to make a difficult task uh, as, as we move forward. Uh, it's really going to put a lot of the pressure on, on high school coaches and club coaches to, to have good conversations and have the right fit for players, um, and and you know we're gonna we're gonna really get an opportunity to to build those relationships and 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 find the right fit. But um, you know I think we're gonna persevere. I, I'm excited about the challenge uh, of recruiting kids right now, and I'm excited about the challenge of of building. You know, we just got off a call with my staff this morning before joining everybody, and we were talking about how can we. How can we go virtual? How can we go online with our players and, and, and get them ready for the fall season? You know, no, no high school season, no graduation, no prom, no summer baseball. Um, how are we going to get these kids ready in the fall uh, to compete and, and play at a high level? And so I think we're, we're excited about the challenge. And then you also look at the challenge of recruiting. Um, how are we going to be able to recruit in the future here if we can't see these kids play? So I guess I'll leave it there for you guys. But uh, I like the challenge, and, and hopefully we're able to, to come through with it. So what, what's your recommendation when you have coaches online, but also players? If you're a high school kid, what do you do? I guess, you know, because this is new for me, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, what do you do as a player? Do I send you information? Do, you know, um, what's, the, what's the goal here for a young player? Yeah, you know, as we as we go through this, I think, you know, we, we, we have to continue to, to, to go back to the basics, you know, believe in yourself, don't give up, continue working, find a way to 
find a way to do it with all the, without all the technology. But, you know, if, if you're a player and, and what do you do, uh, you continue to send us information, videos. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the basic things that are going to shine through. Uh, do well in school because that's going to really give, open up a lot of doors for you when you get ready to go uh, to college or you're in the midst of going to college. You know, do well with your character as a person and have people talk about how hard you work and, and what kind of person you are. Um, you do well at, at working at the game of baseball so that uh, you have an opportunity. So it's going to go a little bit away from just the skill sets now. And we're going to have to start trusting uh, good people. So please send us videos, uh, have your coaches call us, uh, stay with emails. Um, you know, an old school, everyone came to a camp or they got in front of you in a showcase. And, and now those kids need to be a little more proactive in, in really narrowing down the fit for them. Where, where does it fit for them? Where, where does it fit? Where are they going to get the best opportunity uh, to play or, or best opportunity to showcase their skills. You know, the high school coaches around the country, very critical to the development of these young kids. They got them for, you know, three, four years, four years, basically. Um, how's your communication with the high school coaches? How does that work? Especially now with things changing with showcases and technology and, and all kinds of things going on. Yeah. You know, I, th I think our, our communication with the high school coaches is, is good in a lot of ways. Um, but I wish it, would, it was better. I, I wish that the coaches really understood what we need from them. And, and I wish we understood uh, how to listen a little bit better to what they need from us as, as college coaches. So um, we work hard at, at trying to communicate and, and, and stay in there uh, with the right type of people and the right type of players. And, you know, there's a, there's a certain type of player, I guess, for every program, and we just have to find the right fit uh, and the right kid for each program. You know, and the high school coach obviously has a pretty good pulse on, on the actual athlete because, you know, we can go to showcases and you can see guys play and, okay, they, you know, they'll get three at-bats and you see certain things skill-wise, but you really don't know the heart of that player. Um, you know, that, that's why I believe the high school coach has a good pulse on this. So I'm assuming that as a college coach, once I see a player I like or hear about him, I've got to communicate most, most importantly to, with the high school coach, especially if I know him well. Yeah, a, a lot, of, lot of really good communication with the high school coach. Uh, you know, the club coaches, uh, that has been uh, probably even a better communication piece uh, for us. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways, um, this has become a difficult prospect of trying to get kids to colleges. So sometimes there's overselling and sometimes there's underselling and, and sometimes there's the correct selling. And so we, we have to figure out who's going to oversell, uh, who's going to undersell and, and who's actually just going to give us the, the straight, straight line. And I think that's, that's kind of the same thing. I think that club coaches and high school coaches are hoping from us. You know, who's going who's gonna to give us the straight scoop on, on getting kids to the right spot and giving them an opportunity to play and, and be successful? You know, that reminds me because I, I agree with uh, when I was an independent ball, I'd get a lot of uh, professional scouts calling me and they'd say, uh, you know, I've got a player for you. And I'd ask him, well, can he play right now? Because <laughs> I don't need a guy to project, you know, three, four years. And independent ball, we got to win now. So I understand where you're coming from there. What type of players does Nino look for? What, what's the characteristics of the players you like? Uh, give us an example. Who, what type of player you're recruiting? Yeah, you know, I think uh, that's a great question. And I think, you know, it's it's. It's a it's a interesting answer, but you, we're always looking for you know we're always looking for the great character. We're always looking for the great work ethics, and I I think when you when you look at that, uh, there's a direct correlation for us. You know how well does a kid do in school? That kind of correlates to how hard he's going to work on the field and how hard he's going to work uh, as a player. And I think you know everyone's. Uh, been watching the last dance and and if you haven't you'll get a chance to see it with uh, you know with with Michael and I think they talk about greatness and they talk about uh, you know the greatness of Michael and the greatness of the Bulls and I think we're looking for kids that want to be the greatest version of themselves 
whether that's if that's a 3.2 GPA or that's, uh, you know, whatever that is on the field, we're looking for kids that want to reach their greatest potential that they possibly can get to. And I think that's the perfect fit for us uh, at the college level is, is kids that, that want to just continue to get better and continue to work uh, and continue to, to find information and, and find those communication skills. But <clears throat> if we could find great working kids with high character uh, and uh, the, the need, uh, obviously the ability to want to continue to get better all the time, that's the perfect fit for us. You were, uh, or also I know you got recruiters, uh, some of your coaches, um, you show up at a workout, whether it be a showcase or wherever it may be, what, what turns you off from a, of a player possibly you were looking at somebody you liked you know you statistically wise or coaches told you about them what can turn you off well you know I, li I like to get there early and I just like to observe but uh, uh, just just watching kids interact just watching how they how they're dressed just watching how they talk just watching how they interact with people I think uh, those relationships are really important you know how he interacts with his teammates um, what could really turn me off is kids that are lazy or kids that are interested in the wrong things that, you know, may be interested in things that are egotistical. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking to my recruits and a lot of times I'll say, you know, how did, how did you guys do today? And the response I usually get from young kids are, Hey, I was three for three. And I have to go back sometimes and say, no, no, I asked how the, how the team did today. <laughs> You know, how did the team do today? Oh, we, we lost 7-2, but I was 3-for-3. Three three. And when I hear those things, those are, those are things that turn me off. But then again, you know, I'm interested in kids that are successful. But I'm really more interested in kids that, that, that want to see the teams do well. In, in today's world, sometimes uh, there's not enough competition. Uh, there's a lot of showcase events, and there's a lot of events. And you know, I, I teach competition for a living. So when I go someplace, I'm looking for competitors. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that turns me off is when kids are not competitive enough uh, within the game or within everything that they're doing. Um, you know, I've made a few mistakes along the way as a coach. I've gone to see kids play and kids don't run hard to first base or they don't go on and off the field hard. And, and I don't recruit them and they end up becoming – really good players but that's just a small piece of of what i do is i'm i'm just looking for that i only get one or two opportunities to see every kid play so i'm really looking for that high character that high work ethic i'm looking for those kids that are going to do the extra things that that make themselves successful because that's and that's what ends up winning uh at our level and that's what ends up being successful at our level you know, you've had the great honor of obviously representing our country as a USA Baseball national team coach. Uh, I don't think there's anything better than that. Coming from international baseball, I think international baseball is one, one of the best things to be involved in. Um, you know, with the selection process, whether it's college or the national team, uh, parents, because I know we, we don't have parents on the line, but I want to ask you about this. Um, parents, how much of a role do they play in when you select the player because sometimes they come along with the package. Yeah, that, that's an interesting piece, you know, where uh, we're always trying to figure out um, where those parents fit in, you know, um, in the recruiting process, when we sit in the office and we have the player with the parents, uh, if the kid speaks for himself, uh, that's a plus in, in any column. A lot of times when the, parents don't allow the, the kid to speak for himself, uh, that, that makes for a very difficult situation because there's going to be some, some bumps al along the road when he has to start thinking for himself and, and getting himself to practice and to weight workouts and, and, and you know, having to overcome adversity uh, at a higher level. Um, I, I really look for the opportunity to, you know, how far – did that apple fall from the tree? You know, where, where is it going to be? And if, if the parents have a good grasp on it, the kids usually do, but I usually don't punish the kids for, for what the parents do. I give the kid an opportunity to, to be successful on his own. Um, 
as, as time has gone on, we have parents that are a little more involved or too involved at times. And we really like to have that communication with the kids, but we definitely have to uh, involve the parents in everything that's going on because, you know, they're, they're a big factor in, in helping pay for the education of college. And they're a big factor in the development of that character of that individual. Um, so that's a, I would say that, uh, you know, when I, when I speak to my wife, I have to be very careful so I don't get in trouble. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I think when I speak to parents, I got to be very careful so I don't end up getting in trouble. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I've always said that, you know, it's, it's that fine line, you know, um, especially even high school and even in, uh, in travel ball, you know, where, you know, how far do you get the parent involved? And I think if you, if you isolate them too much, that's when you get in trouble. I think that fine line is, you know, obviously playing time, they have, they have no say so in that. But I think in other things, if you get them involved and you're confident in what you're doing, um, I think they can be very helpful. I've advised them and have been very helpful. Yes, you're always going to have somebody that you don't get along with. You know, some, that, that one parent that doesn't believe anything you do, uh, there's not much you can do there. But here's what, where I want to go with this. At the younger levels, you're seeing a lot of these, player come, a lot of these players coming up and coming to your program. And you see them at showcases and all that. What's your advice? Where, where are we going wrong at the young levels, whether it be travel teams or even high school? Where are we going wrong in development? Um, that you're seeing, you know, that's not working out when, when you're getting them to college? Yeah, w what a great question. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I, can, if I can pinpoint what's going wrong. I, I know what's not working uh, when they get to, to the level that we're at is that they're not competitive enough. Uh, they haven't been through enough adversity to understand that. And I think in a lot of ways, when you look at the younger levels, uh, these kids are, the end result is a college scholarship. You know, the end result is the draft. Uh, the, the end result for a lot of these parents and me having been one of those parents that, you know, had a, had a son play for me, it's just their end result sometimes, that's not the end result. The end result is development. The end result is, is can you make an impact at the college that you're going to? The end result is, can you go into professional baseball and, and make it an impact? And sometimes we're always looking at end results uh, at the youth levels. You know, we're, we're doing all this for an end result. And I think the end result should be the de development of the person. Uh, can we make good people? Can we make good leaders? Can we make great individuals? And that's what sport was eventually uh, developed for is, is to develop the character of, of young kids so that they could become great adults. And right now, it seems like at the youth levels and, and every level that I go to, the end result is a scholarship to help pay for college or it's money to go in and be a professional athlete. And I think we need to switch that a little bit. We need to continue to to strive towards development of competitiveness. We need to, we need to continue to strive for the work uh, to become great or become better as a person and as a teammate and as a player and as a, as a cog in, in what we're going in this, in this will. So um, I think that's my biggest uh, pet peeve for me is when the kids get there, I know I need to work at competition because you know, fellas, in a game, if you don't get your five hitters out, they, they don't spin the inning. Uh, you know, the inning doesn't – you just you just don't go to the next pitcher and spin the inning after five hitters. You know, you have runners on base with no outs, and you've already given up runs. The only time the inning spins is when coach comes out to get the ball from you and say, hey, you didn't do your job. But it's a lot of times in these in these situations where you face five hitters – the inning ends and there is no, there's no damage. You don't have to feel the pain of, of giving up three or four runs and losing the game for, for your team. And I think the same thing happens offensively for these kids. You know, um, you get three or four at bats and uh, can you move runners? Can you score runners? Can you do the things that your team needs in order to be successful? And there's a lot of good coaches, I'm sure, on this podcast, on this call. And they work at that. But then there's a lot of kids that 
they're working at launch angles and power numbers. And uh, I'm working at moving runners and scoring runners. And I want guys that can put the ball in play with two strikes. So I think I expand a little too far on that. But realistically, we, we, have, to, we have to scale it back and we have to get in the present moment. So I think that's the best answer to that question is, can we get these kids into the present moment and not living too far in the future? And can we get these kids in the present moment and not living too far past? And I think, you know, that's maybe one of the greatest things we're in right now with uh, this pandemic is it's put us all into the present moment. Uh, mm. this, this is where we're at. We can't, we can't, well, will we have baseball? I, who knows? What can I do now to get better? Oh, I wish I could go back and play another season. Well, you can't go backwards. You can't go forward. We are where we are right now, and we have to make the best of it. You know, I love the part you said about the competition. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from college coaches, I can't find players that can compete. On that, um, what's your recommendation, you know, your type of players, when you get them, they say they can't compete. What are some things you do to get them to compete? What situations you might put them in? What drills you might do? Anything that you, that you can come up with to help some of the coaches? Yeah. And that's an interesting question uh, that gets asked a lot over the last month and a half, or wh what do you do in practice that teaches competition? And uh, a lot of it is, you know, you have to recruit good players at every position and, and they have to be pushed, but you just think about what are you doing just with your team to, uh, to teach competition? Well, you have to keep score. Uh, you have to have leaderboards. Uh, you have to give awards for the guys that hustle. You have to have the times of home to first and have guys compete within those times in order to be better runners home to first. You have to, to value the right things. You know, you have to value putting the ball in play. You have to value moving runners. You can't just value the home run or, or the batting average. And so we, we as a group, we have to start putting numbers together. What we do in practice a lot of times, you know, is – when we practice from a defensive standpoint, you know, there's a time clock that, that we want to uh, practice under so that the speed of the game doesn't speed us up to where we go out of control. So we don't always want to speed everything up, but we want to slow everything down. And so in practice settings, we have to, we have to compete like that. And it's, it's the same thing. There's a winner and a loser every single day at practice for us. Every drill we do, there's a winner and there's a loser. So when we're doing uh, bunt coverages and the last, the last rep of a bunt coverage, there's a winner. Either the defensive team gets the out or the offensive team gets the 90-foot chunk. And whoever wins that, I let them celebrate. You know, like it's a walk-off, like it's a game walk-off. It's a five, ten-second celebration, but either the offense celebrates or the defense celebrates because I want the other team that loses to feel the pain of what it's like not to be in that celebration. And I want the team that succeeds to celebrate those small victories. So we do that in our bunk coverages. We do that in our rundown drill. We do it in a pop-up communication drill. Uh, we do it in our base running segments of that. And then we also, we kind of catapult that into the game. You know, when someone wins a game or loses a game, the winners get to shake hands and go through the line and the losers, they have to stay in the dugout and watch that. Uh, we have to put a premium on winning and losing so that kids understand how to compete and, and they got to understand what it's like when they win. And uh, you know, winners, obviously with Augie Garrido, winners get treated differently. Augie always said that yeah. you know, winners, winners get treat, treated different than losers and, and kids need to understand that. Um, but I think in, in today's world, we all get treated the same, whether we win or we lose. And sometimes that doesn't teach the competitiveness. Uh, Drill-wise for us, you know, what do, what do we do drill-wise to be competitive? Uh, all of our offensive drills are competitive and, and we keep statistics on, on who has the best statistics moving runners and who has the best statistics of scoring runners and who puts together the most at bats that are positive at bats. So the batting average we've kind of taken out of the equation 
because that's very misleading in, in a lot of ways, as is the ERA. So those two things we see as, as very, very misleading. Absolutely. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, I'm going to take a question from uh, Patrick from Switzerland. Do you view participation trophies as a wrong incentive to pl for players' willingness to work and grind through adversity? Um, you know, it just depends on what age level. Um, and I guess that that would be somewhat of, of a different answer. You know, maybe if we teach the young kids a participation medal, then they expect it as they get older. Um, you know, I, I think there's got to be some good in the participation piece of it. I don't, I don't see it as, as negative, but I do, I, I do know this, um, and maybe this will help in the answer of that. My daughter was a highly successful competitive soccer player, and she won 200 trophies as a young girl competing at the soccer uh, level. Uh, where are those trophies now? Uh, they're in a box in the basement that nobody sees. Yeah. So do they have some value at the time? They probably had some value, but do they carry value all the way through? Probably not. Cause those are participation medals that gave her some confidence, but don't really know where they, where, where they are now, as far as in her lifetime, have they helped her? Sure they have, but where will they be? They're in, they're in a box. Yeah, and sometimes I wonder, you know, the, like you said, there, sometimes we're rewarding third place, fourth place, fifth place. We're making it sound like glamorous. I mean, depending what level they're at, boy, that could be misleading. You know, you've got 800 wins at a high level of collegiate baseball. Um, I know it's not just you and you got coaches and teammates and the, and the players and everything. But when we talk about, the, you know, building a culture, build, building relationships, what, what, how did you get to that level? Because everybody thinks, you know, chemistry and, and culture a little bit differently. How do you view it? Yeah, well, wonderful. I, I, chemistry and, and culture completely, completely different in a lot of ways. But the chemistry that you built is, is because of the culture that you have. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, how did we get there? Well, in, in 2006, uh, we played in a regional at the University of Nebraska, uh, first regional in 160 years for the University of San Francisco. Uh, we were coming home from getting beat by Miami in that regional, and and one of my assistant coaches, I said, you know, it'd be nice to put down on paper some of the things that we've done that made us successful to this point. And I think what I'd like to be able to do is go back and look at those characteristics of what we've done successfully so that we don't walk outside of that and want to reinvent the, the, the board. Right. And so we put together our culture, the D, the O, the N and the S and inside that culture, we put, you know, player driven people ad right on it. Uh, you know, whatever those buzzwords were, we put the culture of these are the things, these are the kind of kids that we recruited these are the kind of things that we've done that have made us successful. You know, we've stayed in the present moment. We've worked extremely hard. We've been simple as students and as people and as players. And so we put that up on the board and we said, well, let's, let's don't go outside of that. Let's, let's continue to go back to this culture because this culture is what's going to build this chemistry that's going to allow us to be successful on the field. And boy, it's an everyday struggle to build culture, how our kids respond to the coaches, how the coaches respond to the kids, how the players respond to each other in the locker room, how we respond at practice. Um, I kind of give, I'll give you this because this, this is an interesting story and I'm not trying to be egotistical or go back and talk about myself, but, we were playing at Cal Berkeley this year. And uh, after the game, one of the guys that writes for the newspaper, he, he, he asked me a question. He said, you know, coach, it's, it's, very, it's very prevalent when I watch your team play that your guys finish every single play. Uh, it, it, how does that happen? How, how, do you, how do you get them to finish every single play? 
and and for me that's a chemistry issue right but it was a it was a great compliment because i said you know we talk about that in our culture every single day finish school work finish reps in the weight room finish sprints on the field finish plays at practice finish practice finish seasons uh <laughs> Finish conversations with your parents. Finish conversations with people you walk by with every single day. And I was so excited that he realized that because I was like, that's been a goal culturally for us forever is to finish plays. Every day at practice, we, we talk about, well, we need to finish better. We need to finish plays better. We need to finish the game better, no matter what the score is. And I think that becomes a cultural thing that builds into your chemistry because now when guys aren't finishing plays, players are telling other players, Hey, you need to finish plays. And that becomes not only a cultural thing, but it becomes a, a chemistry. And so for us, in a lot of ways, we just continue to talk about those small things that make a difference, you know, making your bed every single day saying please and thank you whatever those things are that, that are in your culture, I think they eventually become what happens to the chemistry of the group. You know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Japan and, uh, and, and I've talked about it several times on the show. You know, I had a Japanese team and if you went to their game, they could be down 10 to nothing and you'd think it was a tie ball game, uh, vice versa. You could be up, you know, they could be up 10 nothing, and yet you'd think it was a tie ball game. I mean, they're constantly playing hard all the time. But I know this doesn't happen within one season only or, or, or two months. It's important that we create this type of atmosphere culture that you're talking about at the younger levels. It'll make it a lot easier. Not only will it help the younger coaches working with these players produce better players you know, and ultimately also win more games – because they are playing together, but then it also helps college baseball, correct? Oh, I think, you know, I think culture is a never ending process. It starts from the time you, you, you very first play a game or, or you're with your family and, and, and it continues, uh, you know, and it, it continues even, even in our team right now, I think we feel really good about our culture. And then we're like, boy, we need to continue to work at this every single day if we want to be successful, because there's always a factor that's getting tore down and never too young to start the cultural work with kids, never too young, never too young from the time they very first start playing uh, to when they get into high school, to when they go to college, to when they become pros, whatever that might be, but, but never too young. Uh, the Japanese do such a wonderful job uh, with the cultural piece. We had a kid, Ricky Yurata, that played third base for us this year. And I'm listening to you talk, Pete, and you never, you never knew whether Ricky was 0 for 3 or 3 for 3. You never knew whether we won or we lost. You didn't know whether he had a good day or a bad day. He was so consistent. Um, and, and, I, and I asked Rick that question, Rick, what, what is it? And he said, I just try to get better every single day. I just try to find a way to get better every single day. And I think we have to build that culture into the United States and into youth baseball and into high school baseball. Absolutely. Matter of fact, I, you know, I mean, you mentioned where culture, it's actually built into their culture. Cause I mean, the, from the minute you're born, you're, you're being, you're being told all this and trained to do this. Um, you know, I've had Japanese players that, you know, um, you're right. You can never tell what their emotions are, but yet, you know, they've started them real young in training and doing those things. When Nino Gerentano has a player that doesn't hustle, that maybe should have taken the extra base and didn't, uh, whatever the situation may be that you didn't like, how do you deal with that? Well, <laughs> There's the young version of Nino Gerritano and there's the wiser version or older version of Nino Gerritano. So uh, as, as, a, as a young coach, maybe didn't handle it as well as I needed to. I, I was a little too emotional, a little too aggressive, and, and I got too angry about it. As a, as a more mature coach, <clears throat> you know, I can, I can separate the emotion and still give the message. 
um, of, of how to do that. Um, you know, and I love to tell stories and, and hopefully you guys indulge me in a few stories, but you know, this year we're playing at home and one of our kids hits a ball off the right field net and our net's 60 feet high. So it's like Fenway Park down the right field line. And we got a kid at first base that is a plus runner. He's a, you know, he's a six, three runner in the 60s. So he should be able to go first to home on that ball that gets up off the right field net. And uh, he's standing at third base at the end of the play. And I'm like, whoa. I don't think he gave the best possible effort uh, that he could give. And the guy gets a base hit and the guy comes in the dugout. And uh, I said, uh, hey, Nick, did, did you run hard enough uh, on contact? And he looks at me and the kid standing next to me said, hey, Nick, we need a better effort out of you. And I said, whoa, the, 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 the good thing about that is here's me trying to be very political about it and the players being the young version of myself. So that's a cultural thing where the kids feel confident enough to, to tell each other to give the right amount of effort. But, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, I'm in charge of their effort. I'm in charge of their attitude. Uh, I'm in charge of those things, you know, like I, I help them with the effort and the attitude. Um, and they help themselves with that. But I never, I never feel ashamed of myself if I have to talk to them about giving us better effort or giving us a better attitude. Um, you know, as far as the skill, skills piece go to the game, you know, if, if you're having trouble hitting or you're having trouble catching it or you're having trouble throwing it accurately, we could work at the skills of the game. But if you're not, if you're not playing hard enough, and you're not responding well enough to adversity, I, I feel like it's, it's my place to be able to have that conversation with them because I want them to be able to hold themselves to a standard of where they give great effort every single day uh, and, and their attitude is, is great every single day. Those are things that they can control. You know, you're talking about skills. What do you think younger players skill-wise lack that they need to work on more? Uh, the, yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think the biggest uh, skill development piece, obviously, that, that kids haven't figured out yet is the competitive piece. And I go back to that, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a skill. I think being competitive is a skill. I think staying in the game every pitch is a skill. Uh, and I think that that's lacking. I think they, they understand home runs and they understand, you know, launch angles and bat speed and running speed and arm strength and they understand all those things but the biggest skill that's lacking right now is the ability to actually play the game um you know do do the little things inside the game uh to be successful and so uh, you know obviously the hitting piece of it is a skill that we're developing we have hitting coaches and and kids have a place to go and and work at it the defensive skill is, is, is something that we keep continually getting better at. Uh, the base running piece of it, not as much. I think we're lacking the skill to be really quality base runners. Um, I know I show my age, uh, not only with the gray hair, but we played rundown in my front yard when I was a kid, you know, until the point where my dad got mad that we were wearing holes in the grass in the front <laughs> yard because that's where we were sliding. But you know, we learned how to slide in the front yard. We learned how to tag. We learned how to space ourselves. We learned the competitive piece of not getting, giving up. Uh, we have to teach that now. Uh, we have to teach kids correct spacing and rundowns. And we have to teach kids communication on a pop-up. Uh, you know, whether it's ball, 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 or I got it, I got it. I mean, that was never an issue when we were throwing the ball up in the front yard and communicating with the guy next to us. I mean, there were, there were specific rules. So I think the ability to actually play the game uh, and, and, and be, able to, uh, be able to take constructive criticism. And I think that's the, the, that you may look at the skill levels and you may be talking about just hand-eye coordination or bat speed. We're not lacking any of those anymore. Mm. We're just lacking the situation of can, can, we, can we constructively criticize you and you can get better. 
Uh, you know, Coach Fuller's got a great question. I remember in an earlier episode with Tony LaRusso talking about this. Um, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to oh, – I almost lost it. Sorry about that. He, about he basically, the team captains? Yeah, about team captains. Do you have them, and uh, what's your expectations from them? Yeah. Uh, Mark, a great question, obviously, about, about the team captains. And we have, we have what is called the Leadership Council, right? Um, and we have six kids in our program that are in the leadership council. And that leadership council is, is something that that would be somewhat pretty close to, to what you're talking about from a team captain. But when you pick team captains, that's one or two kids. And maybe sometimes that's a vocal piece. We want them all to be leaders. We want to teach them all to be leaders. So we want them to strive towards being in that in that leadership council piece of it where I have six players that I kind of pick and there's probably five guys that are real close to getting in there so there might be 11 kids that are in the leadership council and then there's another five that are working towards hey I want to be in that leadership council so sometimes we have 17 or 18 kids that probably should be worthy of the leadership council I think if you're, if you're talking about picking a team captain and you had one or two, hopefully you have another two and another two and on maybe a 19 or 20 team high school team, maybe you have six to eight kids that probably should be wearing that C uh, as a team captain. Uh, but the one, that, the one that usually becomes the leader as far as a team captain or the leadership council are the ones that practice the hardest, play the hardest, overcome adversity uh, the best, treat their teammates with the right type of humility and, and, and pick people up. So in order to pick a team captain, pick people that are gonna pick people up. A lot of times that, that team captain went to the guy that was the best player. And sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes that just doesn't always work for us. So we share that so that every year when those six leadership council players are gone, there's six more that are in the, in, the, in the waiting to become that. And then there's six more. So there's no social promotion. It's not just that hey, you're a senior, so now you get to be a captain. We're hoping that one of our freshman kids has that leadership capability uh, to, be a, to be in that leadership council or a team captain. But yeah, done correctly, done correctly my expectations of a of a leader uh has to be someone that could really communicate someone that could really work uh someone that could really pick people up so if you want to be a team captain you have to be able to pick two or three players up on that team every single day and and raise their level of of play you know one of the things we talk about a lot on the show and i'm sure it's it's a common theme you know, we know the game of baseball is not easy. There's a lot of failure. Um, you know, your players are going to deal with failure. Give us some advice on how you work with your players when they're going through struggles, whether it be a, you know, a hitting slump or whether it be pitching. It doesn't matter, really. Just a tough time they're going through. How do you deal with that? Or even during the game when they do fail and, and they get down. Yeah, I, I, I think it starts in practice. Um, you know, it, it starts in practice. And then it continues into the game. It starts in recruiting and then continues into practice and then goes into the game. Um, you have to teach failure. You have to find people that, are, that understand how to fail, um, you know, and, and what drives them. Does it drive them to be better or does it tear them down uh, to be worse? Um, and, you know, I, I basically, I don't know if anyone on this panel, anyone here today has heard me speak before, but – I really have three principles that have guided my career, right? Uh, confidence, aggressiveness, and relaxation. Those, those three principles have kind of guided my career. You know, I, I feel like my job as a coach is to teach confidence. Can I make you the best confident version of yourself as a player? How can I teach you to become confident? Well, I got to teach you how to overcome adversity I got to teach you how to fail if I'm going to teach you how to become confident, you know, aggressiveness. I have to teach you the right amount of aggressiveness in order to be uh, the right kind of player in order to be confident. Cause if you're aggressive, you're probably confident. 
If you're confident, you're probably aggressive. And now the relaxation piece, right? The relaxation piece. How do, how do I teach you the relaxation piece? And if I can figure out at practice, I really teach in those three buckets all the time. I'm always teaching, trying to give kids confidence. I'm always teaching, trying to make them aggressive enough that they could be successful. And then I'm always teaching them the relaxation piece. How do we get breathing in there to get you to relax? And so to answer your question, Pete, what happens in game situations when guys struggle, uh, that's usually a very easy conversation with, hey, let's take a breath. How about if we go in the nose and out the mouth? And how do we let go of that and move to the present moment? So a lot of my thought process and, and teaching really revolves around getting back to the present moment. You know, can we get back to the present moment? Um, and I've talked about that a few times here today where if we could teach kids how to get to the present moment, put my arm around you sometimes, you know, sometimes just try to get you out of your own way. Like uh, we have a saying and we have a, a acronym in our dugout it says 11 seconds, right? And people come in and I recruit them and they say, coach, tell me about the 11 seconds. And I'm like, hey, you got 11 seconds to get over a mistake in the game of baseball. And if you don't get over that in 11 seconds, get back to the present moment, you're going to struggle. Uh, you have 11 seconds to celebrate a home run, a base hit, a nice play, a good pitch. And if you don't get back to the present moment in 11 seconds, then you're going to have some trouble in those next 11 seconds. And so – a lot of times you'll hear that come out of our dugout where we'll look at a kid and we'll say, Hey, 11 up. And he'll look at me and he, he knows exactly what 11 up means. Meaning, Hey, you got 11 seconds to be disappointed in yourself for making an error, making a bad pitch, saying something stupid, you know, not paying attention. If you can get back to the present moment in 11 seconds, you got a really good opportunity to be successful. And you know, I don't know how many married guys are on this, but I bring in the marriage piece. You know, my wife gets mad at me. I take my 11 seconds, boys. I take 11 seconds, you know, when I, and it, that usually keeps me in a pretty good situation. You know, when I get mad at the umpire, sometimes I take my 11 seconds because that's usually what gets me in a lot of trouble is in those 11 seconds right after a bad call. That's usually when I get ejected out of a game, right? And I have to take and so I try to teach the kids, can we live in these 11 second intervals within the game within practice and outside of practice? And I hope that answers that. I hope that answers that. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, I, I keep going back because I always go back to the younger kids saying, you know, we got to do a much better job with the real young kids when they're starting off at 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old to, to create these situations for them, you know, let them fail a little bit. I know a lot of times, you know, as parents, I know parents tend to put their own kids, and I understand why, they put them in positions to succeed. The problem is later on when they get to the higher levels, they can't deal with the failure. So I'm, that's why I'm thrilled you brought that up. And one of the things that you have said, and, and I know it's a saying, but it also has to be, I guess, you know, accomplished. Um, and that is, you got to be patient, but, but you also have to believe in the process. Sometimes that's easier said than done. Uh, talk about that. Yeah, you know, I think um, in a lot of ways, yeah, you do have to be patient. You have to have a process that you believe in, but you have to be able to go back to that process in order to find the patience piece of it, right? And we talk to kids a lot about, you know, what is your process? What is your process? What is your process when you step in the batter's box? What do you look at on the bat? Where does your breath come from? How do you get yourself to the present moment? What is your process in practice? Because a lot of kids are really good players in practice, and then the game comes, and they lose their process because it's all about results now when the game's going on. And you have to really keep them in their process of how do, how do I stay in the present moment? How do I help this team? What do I need to do now in order to be successful? How, how is that all going to take place? And you just become maniacal 
about the process. And sometimes when someone interrupts your process, you have to be able to make adjustments. And so I think that's where the patience piece comes from is you're in your process. Someone takes care of your process and throws you out of your process and has you down O2 with the sharp slider. And it's like, okay, how, what do I need to do? I need to step out. I need to take a breath. I need to just be simple and put the ball in play. You know, I, three balls, no strikes, bases loaded. Uh, I just got to go to the center of the plate and compete. I got to take a deep breath and get into the strike zone. And a lot of times you'll pull those kids aside and you'll be like, well, why did you wait to three balls and no strikes to get to your process of competing in the strike zone? And a lot of that, you'll ask that question to them. And, and a lot of those kids will be like, well, my heart rate started to go up fast. Uh, I was worried about the call the umpire made that got me into the 2-0 count. And you'll be like, well, how do we get back to your process? How do you get back to the present moment? How do you take that breath? How do, how do you attack the strike zone? It's the same thing with hitters. You know, kids start to slump and you're like, well, are you going to the inside of the ball? Are you making your first movement on time? Uh, did you take your breath? Are you using your eyes? Did you slow your feet down? And, and they'll look at you and you'll be like, well, those are all process oriented questions, but what made you panic? The speed of the game made me panic. The results made me panic. And so they all need to get back into their, they need to get back into their process. And, um, you know, I, I have a really big deal with the patience piece of it is a lot of times I won't step in with kids until they're ready to listen. And so a lot of times I'll let them, I'll let them run down this road a little bit and fail sometimes and fail and fail. And then finally they'll look up at me and I'll say, well, are, are you ready to have a conversation? And if they don't answer, I'll let them run back down that road again. <laughs> but <laughs> A lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll look up and be like, you know, I'd really like to get better. And then that's the time to teach. Sometimes in my young days, I thought every, every opportunity was a time to teach. And I really had to learn how to wait for my opportunity when the door opened. And then that was easy for me to step in and give, give quality advice. You know, coaches, just so you know, we got about five more minutes left. And please, if you got a question, ask it. Uh, you know, on that same level that you're talking about, Nino, um, you know, I know nowadays you hear this a lot, which I think is a, is a good phrase. You, you know, we got to listen more, speak less, um, or we got to let them figure it out. But there's a fine line there, too, because, you know, we can let them figure it out. And they can still struggle to figure it out. I know a lot of guys talk about pitching wise, let, let the body figure it out. It, it'll, it'll happen like it does in the Dominican or other countries. But at times, a coach also needs to, you know, they see something. They could speed up that process a little bit by helping that player. So isn't there a fine line between all that? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a real fine line between. Uh, and I guess that's why we're all in this. And I think that's why there's so many people. Uh, tuning in because we all want to get better. We all want to find a way. Um, I'll give you a, just one piece that I give my coaches every single day. And sometimes it, it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. I, I tell them there's three things that you need to be able to do in today's world in order to be successful as a coach. You need to be brief. You need to be brilliant. And then you need to be gone. <laughs> and, and I tell them that at practice all the time, you know, when, when you, when you're going to speak to the team, can you be brief and can you be brilliant? And then can you be gone? And the gone piece means, can you, can you let them figure out how to do it on their own sometimes? But then when you get a chance to step in there, can you be brief and then can it be brilliant? And then can you be gone again? And that cycle just, continues all the time it seems like it, it's always continuing where they need brief comments and they need them to really stick and then they really need to figure it out for themselves and I think that's something that that I try to do with my coaches and and with my players is is give them that that advice you know Frank Durant has a good question he says is there something you look for and we're going back to recruiting now 
that maybe other guys aren't so interested in? Um, you know, how do you find it? I guess that the question, he says, how do you find it? But are there different things there that maybe other coaches don't look for? Yeah. I, you know, I think in a lot of ways, sure. I think I look for a lot of things differently uh, than, than, than other people, you know, being at a small Jesuit school in, in San Francisco, uh, we have to find our niche and, and we have to find kids that, that are going to make the next jump. And, and what is that special something that they ha have that's going to help them make that next jump? Is it their work ethic? Is it their character? Is it their parents? Uh, is it their body structure? Is it how they play the game? And so I'm always looking for that one small little thing. I mean, I can, I can go with every coach in the country and watch the radar gun and see it say 92, 93, right? I can look at the batting practice and the running and uh, the arm strength, and we can all judge that. But there's all those small qualities, you know, can you, can you move the ball a little bit and get them off of that? Do you have a specialty pitch that, that could really help? Can you, can you do something defensively that, that really makes a difference? Uh, can you run the bases uh, better than everybody else? Uh, offensively, are you a specialty guy? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we can look at, you know, I've had a lot of success with middle infielders, shortstops, and, and I've had some good players that have played for me. Um, and I evaluate shortstops based on the stopwatch. Um, a lot of guys evaluate that position based on arm strength, body type, uh, and foot speed. But I evaluate that off of the stopwatch. And I do it in my camp every single year. I have kids lying up at short and I hit them ground balls and, I click the stopwatch and they pick it up and they throw it over there. And the guy next to me goes, whoo, man, that guy's got a really good arm. And I said, that's 4.9 seconds. And he looks at me and he says, what does that mean? And I'm like, that's 4.9 seconds. From the time he caught it to the time he threw it, if you want to judge his arm at a 70, it's still 4.9 seconds. That means everybody's safe at the college level. Mm. He's going to have to figure out how to speed up his feet where – you see the other kids, those are four ones and, and the arm strength could be a 30 and you'll be like, well, those are the kind of kids that could make plays at the, at the college level. I watch outfielders and I watch them close on a ground ball and throw the ball to home. And if it's a three, four on the, on the clock, those are guys that can play for me because they, they understand how to close on the ball and they could get rid of it. A lot of guys are just doing it in arm strength wise. So, for me, yeah, there are some certain little things as a coach that I think we see. We see how kids move and we see how they compete. And those are the ones that really match for me. You know, interesting you said that because I know, and I hate to go back to Japan again, but it, you go to Japan, you'll see all these shortstops that don't all have great arms, but man, the ball gets there in that 4.0 um, cause they can get rid of it pretty quick. So I love that you said that coach Fuller, you know, and this is another example I love about the show. We got a lot of coaches. I can't mention them all, but coach Fuller, you know, he's a hall of fame coach. He's always online. He's always learning something. And he's got another question or another great question. Um, talk, he says, obviously you've done a great job here and anything else you do that has worked well for you creating player ownership in the program. Oh, for sure. For sure. I, I make it their program. Um, what, what we do uh, to, to create that ownership for them is, is give them a voice, right? Give them an opportunity, not necessarily to, to speak about what they like and don't like. It's just giving them a voice. Like, this is your program. You make it the best you can possibly make it. And if there's something we need to provide for you, uh, something we need to change, something we need to go to. And, and a lot of that is just accountability, right? We do a cultural a uh, piece every Saturday um, where we teach out of this book, you know, you win in the locker room first and it's, it's a wonderful book. Um, and we, we make presentations out of that book where we have three kids every, every week in a chapter, make a presentation out of that book. Um, but that, that gives them the ownership of the locker room that gives them the ownership of the program. 
Um, and a lot of times what they do when they make these presentations, whether it's a song or it's a video, um, but they, they always have an opportunity every week as a team to call each other out and meaning, Hey, uh, you know, Hey, Jimmy, I, that practice yesterday, uh, I saw you run hard to first base and I think that's beautiful. Um, Hey, Joey. Uh, yesterday at practice, uh, I saw you dog it on a, on a ground ball and, you know, your third drill, uh, can you, you need to pick up the pace if you're going to be successful and help us. And it gives them an opportunity to have that voice that they're not only talking about negatives, but the positives. Um, we've had some really interesting things in, in, these, in these meetings on Saturdays before practice when we go in there to make these presentations. The players of the ownership that they take of, hey, you know, uh, whether it's some guys getting bullied in the, in the locker room and, and one of the seniors will be like, that's not acceptable. The way you talk to them in the locker room is not acceptable. That doesn't help us be successful. I've seen so many things happen in this, in this classroom setting for these kids that that gives them ownership. That piece alone gives them ownership to where they're like, hey, we, we own this piece of it uh, as far as what we're doing. You know, coach gets to coach <coughs> and teach the character, but we have to take ownership of how we treat each other and how we talk to each other. So a wonderful question. Love it. And in fact, the back up that question, another great coach, Neil Birch, uh, Bertram, the you know, Neil's an Illinois high school coach. And, you know, I go back, you know, a book I like a lot is the, the book Legacy, you know, which is an all by the All Blacks, the rugby team that builds culture and all that. And there's a lot of good cultural books. That, um, but Neil asks, what, what books, materials do you have your players read? Yeah. Well, um, we read a lot. We have a, we have a library there at school uh, in the locker room uh, that we've built of books. And so depending on where guys are, um, you know, depending on where they are in their career and what books they need to read. And um, we probably have about 200 books in that library. And if, if you just shoot me an email and you'll have my contact information, I'll send you a list of everything we have in our library uh, that would be helpful. Um, but each kid's at a different point. Some kids are reading Blink. Some, some kids are, are reading The Legacy. You know, some kids are reading Grover's book. Um, some kids are, are reading golf is not a game of perfect. Um, you know, some kids, some kids are reading on the black and, and that's one of our left-handed pitchers. Some kids are, are smart enough that we could give them the art of war and they could get into that book and, and read that. Um, Uncommon uh, is another wonderful book that, that our kids uh, ha have been able to, to read. I'll tell you what's interesting, not only just the specific books that they're reading, but we give each kid over the break, which is the winter break, a book to read out of that library. And then we, he does a book report on that based on, on, on what he learns from that book. And usually we kind of match every single kid up characteristically on what they might need. So some kids may need, you know, discipline. Some kids may need forgiveness. Some kids may need some other category and we try to match them up with the book specifically to bring out their characteristics uh, that will be helpful for us as a, as a group. Well, that's well said. Some kids like me need audio. I can't read. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> me too. I got to listen to it. Um, you know, Mark Lynn's got a, a great question here. Um, you know, as far as post game meetings and meetings the next day, um, what have you found that works better and why? That's great a big question. One. A great, great question. Um, you know, I, and, and I've done it so many different ways. You know, there, were, there was a point in my career where we had a post-game meeting after every game, no matter what. And I found sometimes that uh, kids are hungry, they're tired, they're ready to go home at the end of the day. Um, and so later in my career, I'm, I'm probably the last three years, we don't have post-game meetings unless it's absolutely positively necessary. Uh, when the game's over, I let the kids go to the locker room, shower, and get on out of there. And if I have anything to give them, I give them that 
the next day before the start of the game or before the start of practice. Um, I just found that my buildup in a game sometimes came out the wrong way at the end of the game and made him more nervous. And so I, I, I think post-game meetings are good if you, if you have logistical things you need to talk about. Uh, but once the game's over, the kids usually know where they were successful and where they were not successful. Uh, and, and they put in a pretty long day with a three hour game. Um, so what I've really learned how to do is when we win, I never meet with the team. And that's kind of a plus where I'm like, Hey, if you guys win, you don't have to listen to me. But if you lose, sometimes I'll, I'll have a post game meeting once in a while. I call them loser meetings. And I'm like, we got to stop having these loser meetings. We need to have the winner meetings. The winner meetings are when they go back to the locker room, turn on the music and they dance and get ready for the next day. And so I think a lot of that happens. From a practice standpoint, we, we meet post-practice every day to make practice better. But game situations, usually the game's over. I let them enjoy the win. Uh, or when we lose, I let them kind of move past in that 11 second category to, to get ready for the next day. It's going to depend a lot on your team sometimes, because if they need a little more structure, you're probably going to have to be a little more driven in that. If, if they, if they understand how to rebound and be ready for the next day, uh, I think you give them a little bit of freedom, uh, to get on out of there. And when I do have the meetings, I go back to this point, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I try to be brief. I try to be brilliant, and then I try to be gone, fellas. I, I still take that same advice into my post-game meetings. I try to do that very well. Hey, Nino, this has been great. Let's end it on this. Um, we're both Italian-American, both hot-blooded. Uh, we're a little older now, so we're able to control that, that hot blood temper. Um, talk about how you deal with umpires, because you mentioned it earlier how important it is. And also for our younger coaches, in case we got some younger coaches on there, because, and you know, I know a lot of young coaches, even at the, some travel teams that I've been to, uh, you know, don't exactly act really well at games. And I just think it's important. There's a good relationship with the umpire. Talk about how you deal with that. Oh yeah. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, try to get the kids not to build in excuses. So, so for me, <coughs> I try to stay, away from that situation with the umpires where I'm blaming them for the score of the game or, or the at bats. I mean, if I feel like they need to tighten up the strike zone, or if I feel like they might've missed a call, I mean, I'll definitely voice my opinion. If I need to protect one of my kids, I'll definitely go in there and protect the kids. Uh, but I'll never, I'll never scream and yell at umpires. Uh, so that the kids could feel that fuel. And I never let the kids have those kind of conversations. And I, and I won't protect them anymore if they want to complain about umpire's call or they, they want to drive guys sometimes. If, if one of my pitchers is acting foolish on the mound, I won't protect him by yelling at the umpire. I'll, I'll definitely yell at the kid and, and make sure the kid squares it away. But I've really, uh, you know, I, I do lose my temper when I feel disrespected by umpires and I do lose my temper when I feel like uh, the umpire's not listening and trying to get better at the game. Uh, but for the most part, uh, as I've grown, I've gained a lot of respect from them and uh, I've, I've kind of toned myself down to where I'm more interested in what's going on in the game than I am how the umpire's doing in the game. Um, whether they miss calls or, or don't miss calls, I, I want them to, to try to do the best they possibly can. And, and I respect umpires when they say they've made a mistake. Um, and, and I'm fine with that. And, and hopefully they respect us sometimes uh, when we've made mistakes. But I think that's something that uh, you know, we get caught in the heat of the moment, winning and losing, and, and we're always trying to figure that out. And, and we really have to watch ourselves because the kids watch our lead and they follow our lead all the time. And if I'm going to be professing to stay in the present moment, I got to get in the present moment more often instead of going backwards and arguing a call that happened 
five minutes ago. So I need to do a much better job of that every single day, but I, I'm, I'm really well aware of my relationship with most umpires. Um, and I keep a book. I keep a book on every umpire. What his strike zone is like, you know, what his demeanor is like, what he needs. And I'll share that sometimes with our catcher and I'll share that a lot with our pitching coach where, Hey, if we, <coughs> if we don't complain today, this guy's going to hold the strike zone. If we complain today, this guy's going to shrink the strike zone. Um, and so a lot of times I'll, I'll have to really watch myself based on, on who's there. Um, uh, I'll give a shout out here. Billy Hayes is the best umpire I know in the game, right? He's done the college world series the last three years. And I say, Hey fellas, if Billy Hayes not is not behind the plate, make sure that you take it into your own hands to figure out the strike zone. But if he's there, balls are balls and strikes are strikes. So uh, he's, he's the best in the game. You know, and that's great advice, especially with even with young players, because, you know, you go to a game, a young player can use that to their advantage if they know the strike zone, if they know what the, what, what the umpires call. Instead of worrying about, was it a ball and strike, maybe worry more about knowing what the umpire is going to call, a higher one, a lower one, whatever it may be. It's to your advantage. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, kids will come back to the dugout and say, hey, that's two balls off, coach. He punched me out on a one, two balls off. And I said, well, the, where was the first strike? And he said, same spot. Where was the second strike? Uh, pretty much the same spot. I was like, well, whose fault is that? If he called it the first time and the second time, then you have to make the adjustment. And so we got to teach our kids a lot of times how to make those adjustments instead of the, uh, just complaining. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, go back to the Italian American thing. My dad's been kicked out of every stadium I've ever coached <laughs> at. So yeah, I, I've had to work really hard at, yeah. at keeping myself mellow because he could complain from pitch number one of the game, and I got I to gotta refrain from that. Absolutely. I know all about that. Well, listen, man, this has been fantastic. Can't thank you enough, Nino. Great job. Oh, you guys, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you to Nino Gerentano. Thank you to our producer, Brian Kroc, with the Lineup Media Group. Thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world on Zoom. Thank you, guys. If it wasn't for the guys and gals on Zoom and Facebook and all our, on our podcast, we would not get this show out. So thanks, everybody. Remember, it is a show that loves to interview baseball's best coaching minds that love the challenge, the status quo. I'm your host, Pete Caliendo. Tonight, 7 p.m. Central Time, Korean Baseball a pitching coach, development coach. You're going to learn all about what the Koreans do. Remember, the Koreans have won the Olympics and they've been second in the Pan Am, and, uh, excuse me, in the World Baseball Classic. And they haven't been playing the game as long as most countries. Uh, I think it'll be an interesting show at 7 p.m. Central Time tonight. We'll be back with Korean baseball. Stay safe, stay well. We'll see you on the field soon. God bless you. I'm Pete Caliendo. I'll see you tonight.